Thank you, Chief. Uh, I am very excited about this next portion of Connect 14. It's called Connect Talks. Our next group of presentations is modeled after TED Talks. For those of you not familiar with the concept, TED is a nonprofit organization devoted to ideas worth spreading. It started in 1984 as a conference bringing together people from the worlds of technology, entertainment, and design, thus TED. Since then, its scope has become even broader, and you can learn more at TED.com. Here's the key. TED conferences bring together the world's most fascinating thinkers and doers who are challenged to give the talk of their lives in 18 minutes or less. For our Connect Talks, we've given our presenters nine minutes. I guess that means we're half as prestigious as the TED Talks, but regardless, we've got nine minutes now for each presenter. During the next 45 minutes, you're going to learn about some fascinating things that are happening at the intersections of technology, citizens, nonprofits, governments, and education. Our first presenter, Sean Drost, co-founder, lead instructor, and chief commercial officer at Hack Reactor. Sean started coding at 15, writing games on his TI-83. At 17, he was already teaching classes on pointer arithmetic and class hierarchies. He studied computer science at USC and has been a software engineer ever since, most recently leading a technical team at OKCupid Labs. Sean runs the second half of Half Reactor's curriculum, including the self-directed project periods and the graduate hiring program. Sean, please tell us about Hack Reactor. Hi, everyone. Is this on? So great to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I was, uh, I was invited to talk to you about uh, my program, Hack Reactor. Hack Reactor is a three-month program for software engineers. So we teach the people that build the networks uh, that connect our communities. Uh, today I'll be telling you about what Hack Reactor is, how it works, and some surprising lessons that we learned along the way. And I'll start with our founding story, which begins with my buddy Tony. Uh, he's, he's on the right. Uh, he's a very smart guy, uh, studied neuroscience, uh, did, a, did a couple different jobs after graduation, and hadn't really settled on a career. And uh, his brother and I convinced him that he should become a programmer because we knew something that he didn't, which is that uh, there are one million more jobs for programmers than there are programmers. Uh, that's, that's, that's a very large number, which is crazy, right? So we taught Tony to code, and we got him his first job. Uh, and we then decided that there are probably a lot more Tonys, so we started Hack Reactor together. Um, and this is, this is our, our first location, our, inaug in our inaugural class in 2012, late 2012, less than two years ago. Uh, we, uh, our, our first class had 15 people in it, and uh, every single one of them uh, got a job. Today, our, our, uh, our placement rate is 98%. Average salary is $105,000. Uh, and in the two years since then, maybe another 100 schools like ours have started. And this is an actual movement. And I'm, I'm curious, how many of you have heard of, of this movement, boot camps, coding schools, what have you? This is, uh, I'm looking at maybe 2 thirds. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's developing really quickly, and this year Hack Reactor will educate more software engineers than Berkeley, Stanford, and Caltech combined. Uh, we will, uh, our students are more likely than, uh, than, than students at four-year institutions to complete the program. Uh, they'll, they'll, they're more likely to get a job and have a higher average salary. Uh, it's, it's astonishing. Uh, I'm, next up, I'm going to explain uh, how, how we do it, and it's kind of a letdown. Uh, <laughs> it really just boils down to one thing, which is, which is data-driven education. We, are, uh, we decide what to teach, and we, we measure whether or not we're teaching it. And uh, this works on any time frame. This works on, on, a, on, a lecture, on, on the amount of time it takes to teach a lecture. This works across a week of class. Uh, this works uh, across the whole program. Um, and I'm going to tell you about how we apply this concept. 
across three different parts of the school, starting with admissions. So we actually, we kind of look at admissions, we, we were all hiring managers at tech companies, and we, we look at admissions kind of as, as a hiring process in a certain way. And, and uh, the empirically uh, most likely uh, to work uh, method of, of conducting a hiring process is to do a work sample. And, and the work of a student is to, to learn. And so we, we sit down and we actually teach them as a tutoring session. We don't, we don't, there's no, there's no place on the application form where you get to talk about your degrees or write an essay. We just, we just teach you for an hour and we see what it's like. Uh, we have, we have a, a rubric that, that cro that's, it's, it's deeply multidimensional, uh, crossing, uh, you know, intellectual and soft skills and a variety of different topics. Uh, the second area where we apply data-driven education is instruction. So we adopted the instructional model that has been most uh, empirically effective uh, across a, a wide variety of different subject matter. Um, and that's immersion. So, so I, quick question here. How many of you remember taking some kind of language, cl language class in high school or college? Uh, okay, yeah, so, so, and how many of you actually learned, learned the language, like, like you, you speak it now? Okay, okay, so, so, so uh, what, what does it look like when you actually need to teach someone a language? Like let's say you're the CIA and you just need someone to learn this language. You, you, you build an immersion school. It's, it's a, it's, you, you, you make it as short as you can to teach them the thing that you have to teach them uh, and it just goes from zero to 60 uh, and that works. And you see this being reproduced independently by different uh, institutions that need to create effective education. Uh, so this is this is this is uh, one subject uh, area at a time, or rather one competency area at a time, which then goes into different subject matters. Uh, you, this is this is practice uh, on actual uh, tasks with uh, subject matter experts nearby. So this is the second area where we apply data-driven education. And the third is, is student outcomes. This is, this is our ultimate compass. This is actually what inspires the most change class to class in our program as we, as we run it. Uh, and, and this means jobs, actually. We consider it our job to get students a job. And when they don't, we freak out. We feel like our reputation is at risk. We change things in the program. Uh, this isn't because jobs are less necessarily the goal, uh, but it's a good uh, heuristic for, for even the students who aren't looking for work. Um, and that's it. That's the whole story. That's how we run a school where 98% of the graduates get jobs at an average of 105,000. Uh, and along the way, we've learned some uh, surprising lessons, some, some facts about the world that I did not believe when we started out. Uh, the first is that uh, we, we, it, it has to do with college. And, and I, want, I want to get a show of hands about a question here. Who thinks, who thinks of college as a, as a old institution, one that is sort of like lasted for like throughout human history almost, you know? <laughs> show, of, show of hands, wow, almost nobody, wow. Uh, I think, I think it, like, to me, I, I, I thought of college as this thing that's always been around, as this like through, constant thing throughout history, but, but actually uh, we invented college about 50 years ago. I've come to believe we've, we invented college about 50 years ago. It's, we, we, and we, it, it used to be a totally different thing before then. Uh, it, it, it used to be very few people went to it. And the people who went to it, they, 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 had, they had a lot of money, <laughs> by and large. It's not, not a universal rule, but uh, they, they weren't primarily motivated by, uh, by, the, by the work of it. It was sort of like this interesting institution, which was both the home of, of uh, human knowledge and also uh, this place where you could work side by side with these academics. Uh, but actually, what the, there's a new status quo, which is that uh, the, the majority of graduating high school students uh, are planning to attend college. The uh, it's it's primarily funded by debt, and and they're they're by and large empirically much more interested in uh, work afterwards. And that's it, it, this is this has been a complete sea change that ha that that we have just foisted upon this institution that existed, uh, uh, you know, and didn't really ask for this change. And that, you know, in some ways, it's it's resisting the change for for good reasons. You know. I, I went to college, I had a fantastic experience there, and there are a lot of great things about it that would change for the worse if, it, if, if college tried to become this institution that we are 
trying to make it. Uh, so, uh, humorously, the, the, first, the first round of ed tech initiatives uh, kind of just put, the college, put college online. Um, and that's interesting. Uh, they, they have since, I think, recognized this as a mistake. Udacity, in fact, is they've shifted over their entire focus to this concept they're calling micro degrees, which are very short form, immersive, uh, outcomes based. Uh, if you go to their website right now, you'll see, I think, like jobs, careers, jobs. Uh, so that's, it's, a, it's an interesting world. Expect change in this area. Uh, expect data-driven education. Uh, that's, it. that's all I got. Thanks for your time. <laughs>
Hi there, um, I'm Camille. I'm Isabel. And this is our presentation for if it's the end of the world as we know it. How to feel fine during an emergency. And as mentioned, our project is Honor Silver Award, which was a series of videos done with HNN to help boost information about emergency preparedness. So our project was for the Girl Scout Silver Award, and it's the highest award that a middle school uh, Girl Scout troop can earn. And all eight of us have the goal of supporting and helping out our community, which is Hillsboro. Um, Hillsboro is a very fortunate community, and many people assume that since we had a lot of resources that we didn't really need further assistance. However, we thought that um, being prepared for an emergency would be more of a better goal for us and that we should really work on that. And so we based our project off of the H&M prep matrix. So here's the H&M prep matrix and there are tasks and recommendations for each month. And the theory is that if you complete these tasks each month, then you'll be more prepared in case an event happens in the future. Um, when you first look at it, everything seems really overwhelming and uninteresting. For example, there's a lot of text and boxes and just seems very boring. <laughs> um, so because of this, a lot of people didn't really use it. And this was not good because a lot of the information on here was necessary and important to stay more prepared and safe. And because not a lot of people were using it, we decided to make um, inform people in a more interesting way using videos. So the actual video process was a pretty long process. It took us about two years. We started with the information, so writing the scripts. We used the information from the prep matrix and online, of course. And once we had the scripts approved, we did filming scripts, which are these things where you have what you see on one side and then what you say on one side, which makes it very easy to tackle a bunch of different parts of the video. Then we actually put the videos together, which there were many different parts of it. So we had some of us here were on camera, some of us were behind the camera, some of us were telling the people on the camera what they should be doing, and then others of us were doing behind the scenes work. So making graphics, doing voiceovers, adding music, putting the entire video together. In total, of course, there are 12 videos, one per month. And if you want to view them now, you can see them on Facebook. If you look Troop 31175, you can view the videos in order, as well as on YouTube, if you search Hillsborough Neighborhood Network, Prep Matrix, and then whatever month you're looking for, you can also find them there. One of the most important parts of our project was all the help we got from the community because the project was really for the community. So the our community gave us the need, the need of emergency preparedness, and from the beginning to the end, they were there every step of the way. They were here when we were doing script writing, giving us the information that we needed, and telling us if what we had was okay. They watched our first video and told us what was good about it, what we should fix about it. And some of them were actually in the videos. We had the police department here. We had the fire department. We had some of the members from H&N giving us information about how to stay connected. It was really a whole community effort, which was important because it was for the community. Okay, so why videos? Well, videos are very simple and it's very easy for people to share information online, such as on Facebook and YouTube. Um, people can watch videos effortlessly and access them effortlessly. And making videos is a very convenient way to inform the community about information, events, or in our, or in our case, staying more prepared. And videos are actually very, um, great way to incorporate more details and do it in a more entertaining and compelling way. And for us, we actually had a lot of fun making these videos. We made lots of memories and I think I bonded with a lot of the girls in my troop much more by making zombie graphics and handling cute puppies. <laughs> so if you have a need similar to ours, such as maybe you have this great information source out there with this really great system, 
but maybe not enough people are looking at it, or maybe it's not quite interesting enough, or maybe you'd like to put more information, but you don't think if you do that, people will read it as much, then we would really suggest videos are a great way of sharing information. Not only is it easy with all the social networking sites out there, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, all the other ones that exist, there's so many. There's, there's really, there's, it's so easy these days to get your videos up there and get a lot of people to see them. The other thing is videos are really useful. You can put more information there. Though if you do, we just like to warn you, you really want to make sure to catch your audience's eye. So you want to add humor as well. So as we mentioned, those zombie graphics and puppies and fish puns that'll leave your audience hooked. <laughs> and there's just so much that you can do in a video. And finally, if you're doing a project like this, not even a video, but just any project for the community, get them involved from the very beginning and have them with you every step of the way because if it's for them, they want to help out with the project and in the end, you'll have a great project that everyone can use. Thank you. Do we have any questions for Camille or Isabel? Any questions? 36 seconds left in this segment. Yes, ma'am. Joe's bringing a microphone over to you. Hang on just one second. What tools did you use uh, to create the videos? OK, so I'm going to answer that one. <laughs> um, a lot of the tools that we had, it was actually pretty easy to get them because the community that we're in, I know that we, the school that we, go, that we went to, they actually had a filmmaking class and um, elective. So the teacher there had a lot of cameras that we could use. And I know that like we, we used the cameras. And we mostly used um, computers to make the graphics and do the video putting together. And then also, in addition, we used cameras. And a lot of stuff that we had just at our house that we could use for it. Let's hear it for Camille and Isabel in Girl Scout Troop 31175. All right, thank you, ladies. Okay, our next presenter in Connect Talks is Zane Khan. Zane is the founder and CEO of iConstituent, which is a leader in cloud-based government-to-constituent communications. And I know there are many elected folks here whose uh, ears perk up when we say that. iConstituent went from a startup with just one product and a handful of clients to a company that powers the vast majority of congressional e-communications. As a result of his success with iConstituent, Zane is widely recognized as an expert in government constituent communications. Zane holds an MBA from Loyola Marymount and a bachelor's in music from the Thornton School of Music at USC. Although I Constituent is headquartered in Washington, D.C., Zane lives in Southern California with his wife and two children, and that is quite a commute, I think. But we're going to hear from Zane about I Constituent. Zane Cotton. Thank you. Thank you very much, Assemblymember Mullen. Uh, before I start, I want to thank uh, the fine hosts of Connect 14 uh, for uh, inviting me today to uh, this uh, fantastic conference. And I'd like to also compliment uh, my fellow panelists uh, that have already spoken and that, that will speak. Uh, it's really an honor to be amongst all of you. So um, as I was preparing for this uh, conference, the thought that uh, kept on coming to my mind and we've heard about this already by a number of other speakers, is uh, where this thought was the, um, the image of my two daughters. And they're 8 and 11. And I don't know how many of you have children. I'm sure a lot do here. But uh, I, you know, if I leave my Chromebook out on the uh, kitchen counter or my iPhone, it's gone. I mean, and I, I would say to you that uh, you know, if, if uh, my, me and my wife had left the house for a week and we just left the Chromebook and the uh, you know, few other electronic devices there, they'd probably be looking at that the entire week and not eat. So they're really connected. And then I started to think that, wow, you know, what is the impact 
of technology on these two little girls. And, you know, our lives, our personal lives, when I was eight and I was an 11, when I was eight and 11, I mean, you know, I didn't have a cell phone, there were no computers. Uh, when I was about 14, Atari came along and that was awesome. But, you know, they were born connected already. And so I'm sure that this scene is also something that we all, you know, are very used to. I mean, just look around the room. There's people connected here in the room. You go to a restaurant, you know, nobody's talking to each other. They're staring at the, uh, the iPhones or the Galaxy tabs. So we, we live in an increasingly connected society. The impact of technology has uh, been um, tremendous on humanity. And it's not going to diminish. It's going to only increase. Just a very quick uh, anecdote. I was in a uh, uh, public bathroom in, in San Francisco and about two and a half years ago, and I bump into somebody, and he was wearing Google glasses. And I'm like, I, you know, I know that guy. I know that guy. And about half an hour later, I realized, well, that was Sergey Brin from Google, you know, walking around. So I'm thinking to myself, you know, today people are using their iPhones and mobile devices, but in just a few short years from now, everybody's going to be wearing wearable devices, connecting to something, someone, someplace. So it's really, uh, it's really cool. Now, uh, obviously, um, technology has had a huge impact on business. I mean, we're standing in one of those uh, businesses today. Uh, two that come to my mind that are really recent are Airbnb and Uber, and I'm sure a lot of people in this uh, room have tried those services. So it's indisputable that technology has had major impacts on humanity and also on business. But what's technology's impact on government's ability to engage with its citizens? And that, to me, is really near and dear to my heart. Um, so, but before I answer that question, oops, oh, I gave away the punchline. Before I answer that question, let me talk a little bit about uh, a little bit about my company, I Constituent. So, uh, we started the company about 14 years ago, which was a long time ago. When you think about citizen engagement, and uh, the mission statement of the business was very simple back then. It was connecting government. It is connecting government to citizens and citizens to government leveraging the power of technology. So back then, we created a very simple tool that allowed elected officials to essentially send mass email to his or her constituents and then get real-time data back so they would find out how many people opened the message, how many people forwarded the message. It sounds really simple today, and it's quite ubiquitous. There's many hundreds of vendors that do that, not in the public sector, but in general. But back in 2001, it was a really novel approach. So uh, this was 14 years ago. So our first customer was uh, then Mayor uh, James Hahn of Los Angeles. And right after 9-11, he needed a way to immediately communicate with his constituents. So we provided him the tool, and he sent out a message to 1,500 people uh, in Los Angeles. Now, 1,500 people, you say, is nothing. Uh, but back in 2001, there were not a lot of elected officials that had any email addresses at all. So he happened to have some email addresses. We sent it out. And it was our very, very first uh, um, endeavor in this area. And actually, we actually found an old screenshot of the statistics that he had. I don't know if you can really see it, but it says he sent out 1,500. Uh, we mailed 1,500 emails. And of that, 50% were actually opened and looked at. And then we had a high number of people actually forwarding the message to other friends. So our very first campaign was very successful for the mayor of Los Angeles at that time. Just a non sequitur to the story. About two months later, inexplicably, the office of the mayor decided to cancel the service. So I asked them, well, wh what happened? Why are you canceling it? It was a very successful campaign. And they said to me, well, it's really not a proven or tested technology. And you know, we prefer to just take the money and, and spend it on direct mail or whatever they were doing at that time. So, uh, but, you know, funny enough, it was only $200 that we had charged for the, uh, for the service. So the challenges that government faces today with citizen engagement are vastly different than the challenges that the government faced in the past. So the challenges that Mayor Hahn had was sending out 1,500 pieces of email. That was the challenge. But today, the challenge is 
dealing with 15,000 requests coming into an office, or even more than that. Uh, we have customers that you know, have challenges dealing with 100 requests that come into their office, citizen requests. Or 15, you know, so 15,000, um, I'm sorry, 1,500, sending out 1,500 emails is really a piece of cake, but it's dealing with all the inbound requests that come in. So that's the big challenge that government has, a lot of our offices have. So the question is really, well, why are they having these challenges? Why, you know, with all this technology that abounds, why is government having a difficult time dealing with uh, all the inbound requests and, and engaging with citizens? And the answer that I've come across, the answer that I've come upon actually in the last 15 years is that really my customers are using mostly outdated infrastructure. So all of the technology that they're using um, and many of the government agencies that we work with are, are behind their closed firewalls and are not really um, utilizing the most modern technology. So I'm not here to completely uh, denigrate uh, our customers. They're doing a great job. Many of them are really working hard to reach out to their customer base, which is uh, the citizens. But we can be doing a lot better. And so what does that mean? So how, how can we do better? And this is why I'm really excited about what, you know, what's going to happen in the future. So obviously, it's, it's, it's fair to say that government is not hitting its target in terms of its ability to reach, its, uh, to connect and engage with its citizens. But I think that's all going to change in the next, literally the next 24 months. And now why is that going to change? Well, because many government agencies are now moving their infrastructures to the cloud. And what that does is it removes and lowers the barrier that they have to access more modern technology and to be able to use better products and services instead of having to, uh, to depend on services that are behind outdated uh, infrastructures that they use. So, um, um, so some of the services that we provide here, and I'll just talk about our core product, which is the CRM at the top, is uh, currently what we do is we provide that particular product to our members in the Congress, and it's behind their firewalls. It's on their um, infrastructure. But as we move forward, we are going to be able to provide services like that of, of the Congress to all branches of government through public cloud. So for instance, the product that you're looking at is hosted on the Salesforce FedRAM compliant cloud. It is something that all levels of, of government can access and use. So this product over here is a good example of, of how uh, my example a little while ago, but government agencies struggling to keep up with the ever-connected population of people uh, contacting them. Well, this product allows them to essentially do that. It manages uh, thousands of inbound communication flows and allows them to be able to react in days or minutes, not in months and so forth. So a little while ago, I talked to you about uh, Mayor James Hahn, and I showed you the 1,500 uh, emails that we sent out. But this is a more modern, updated product that we have about 14 years later that gives the elected official and any other agency much more uh, insight as to um, what's happening when they send out messages and how it resonates uh, with their constituents. So what I want to do is I want to finish up and tell you, uh, you know, what I think is going to happen in the future. And when I say the future, I don't mean like years and years away. I'm literally talking about 12 months. And there's really three main things that we're going to see. We're going to see a dramatic increase in the adoption of the cloud by really all public agencies. We're also going to, what that results in is a much lower barrier of entry for government agencies to access modern technology. And finally, what that means is, is that's going to give uh, an increased ability to service and engage and connect with your constituents. Thank you. Thank you. We have time for just one quick question for Zane. Any questions? Wow, we're actually going to catch up on time here. Going once, going twice? Yes, sir, Rachel. And we're getting a microphone up to you right now. 
Hi, with all the retailers that are getting hacked, uh, I used to work in Congress. I know the constituent records are extremely sensitive. So how can you protect cloud-based databases? Well, nothing is, uh, uh, you know, security and compliance is something that's very near and dear to my heart, for sure. And uh, we had uh, an incident uh, a couple years ago, so we realized that security is um, an absolute requirement. Now, nothing is 100% secure. However, when you're talking about a FedRAMP compliant uh, data center such as that of Salesforce, I mean, they're using the most maximum uh, security and it meets certain government standards. So that's, uh, there's no way to ensure 100% security. In fact, nothing even behind firewalls is secure behind a government installation either. So, but um, um, certainly uh, Salesforce and Amazon and all the others that are FedRAMP compliant that's as, that's as best as you get, really. But good question. Anything else? Thank you. Thank All you right. for your time. Thank you, Zane Khan. Thank you. With iConstituent and my uh, office, we'll be doing a pilot project with iConstituent. Hopefully, uh, the state of California can catch up where Congress is on these issues. That's kind of a shocking statement, actually. But um, thank you, sir. Uh, Moving to Street Code Academy. We are pleased to have Heather Starnes and Alatunde Sobomihin to tell us about Street Code Academy, a nonprofit, for profit partnership that on ramps youth to high tech jobs by connecting urban culture innovation to the tech industry. Heather Starnes has studied, lived, and worked in under resourced communities for the past 26 years. She has promoted programs for multi barriered youth. Uh, innovative economic development, low-income housing, and program design. She is currently working on her doctorate in educational leadership. Her focus is integrating technology that encourages and engages youth to make choices that keep them alive and free. And a little about a little about Alatunde. While a student at Stanford University, he co-founded Esfache a Silicon Valley-based company that aims to make popular culture positive by providing innovative, technological, athletic, and educational programs to youth in the Bay Area. Tunde, as he is known, was the first non-recruited walk-on to the Stanford Varsity Men's basketball team and voted most inspirational player. Today, he serves as Chief Officer of Vision and Innovation, where he develops new strategies and programs prim primarily focused on culturally relevant technology and new media. Street Code Academy. He is good. Made us sound really good. Um, and I'm sure that the rest of the conference has been um, just the same. If you've enjoyed yourself thus far, can you clap two times? Oh, great, great, great. And if you met somebody new, can you clap three times? Good. Well, uh, we're excited to share with you um, much about what uh, he mentioned, the Street Code Academy. Um, which we uh, aim to have be culturally competent technology um, and business that and business and entrepreneurship uh, that can make community change. Um, I wasn't around here. Uh, I'm proud to say um, that despite uh, having four kids, I wasn't around 40 years ago when this place was actually um, East Palo Alto. And I'm sure if anyone was around 40 years ago, you'd be playing a record player and be jamming out like a, like they, I felt like they were doing outside at lunchtime. You guys missed the Disneyland that was going on during lunch, but it was certainly um, a circus down there. And when you think about, when you think about um, the record player, and then around that same time, about 40 years ago, uh, when you take a look at what some folks um, did down in South Bronx, New York, I'm sure you all have heard on how they innovated on that invention. Uh, that technology had been around for a very long time, but when the tools got in the right hands, what they were able to do was magical. Um, in fact, it was so magical I couldn't get home to my house uh, two days ago because Lil Wayne and Drake decided to do a concert um, down the street from my house at Shoreline. And so it was packed with cars, and I was amazed. Uh, I couldn't tell who it was because the diversity of cars and people who were going to that show just um, shows um, how globalized and how monetized, how popularized hip-hop became uh, after, that after that innovation on top of that invention. Well, a lot of that same stuff is happening, and both Heather and I have worked um, in the areas where we're able to see that same spirit of scrappiness and that same spirit of creativity and that same spirit of innovation happen. And I want to share with you from a project I was um, honored to serve as a deputy director for four years. And in there, we had a project called History Through Hip Hop. And if I can work this thing right, it's going to get you to, oh, that's us. Oh. 
is going to get you to this video here. And our video guy is here. And this video was, um, I would call, innovation on top of a popular song you may heard from KRS-One. And KRS-One had a song called Number One. And we were tasked, uh, there was National Science Foundation that had some, some money available. And so we partnered uh, with them. You can go ahead and press play. This is the intro. Um, anyway, so they, they said, hey, we want to teach science standards. Is the sound on? We want to teach science standards uh, to fifth graders. So we said, no problem. What standard do you want to teach? And they said, the urinary tract. <laughs> and we paused for about 30 seconds and then said, no problem. Right, because the spirit of innovation and creativity and scrappiness is alive today. So here you have, they never play hip hop this low. It's illegal, I'm, I'm, I'm violating. Okay, there we go. Look, the urinary system is down the flush. Cellular waste goes down the flush. Kidneys clean blood cause they down the flush. Convert waste to urine cause it's down the flush. Urigers move urine cause they down the flush. The bladder collects urine cause it's down the flush. The bladder gets full, you might be ready to bust. You can squeeze your sphincter till you've had enough. Go ahead and release it. Down the flush. Urine exits urethra. Down the flush. The urinary system so, is and so down So I'm going to let this play for about 30 more seconds, but I want you to know that after the findings one. came across the United States, uh, science teachers were like, my students can't get enough of this song. In fact, the people who created the song learned more about the urinary tract system. So what we found was that the innovation that is alive today, the creativity needs to be released. Can, can, you, can you nod your head if you agree with that? The creativity that exists today in a lot of the outside communities that are marginalized, that are not able to, to be on the Facebook campuses and the Google campuses uh, exists. That creativity exists. We just need to showcase it and we need to unleash it. And that's what, we've, uh, that's See, what we're doing. I'm kidneys. No, I ain't kidding. I look uh, like two potatoes. Oh, yeah. um. Uh, what I, one of the things I loved about our introduction is that we have zero hours or years in technology, and that is because uh, we are community developers, uh, I am, and he has more technology producing something like that, but generally we're not what you would call hackers or coders. So with this concept of having this, you saw that video of untapped potential. This group of kids are all kids that um, I met, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago when they were younger, uh, particularly when East Palo Alto had a spike in violence. And we started thinking about healing and hope and how do we do this. Well, this is now our college group. Um, they're all in college. They're all in four years um, colleges, and they're moving forward, and there's 44 of them. And it just really came out of like, oh, no, you're brilliant. You're, you're, you're amazing. Take, take your um, infrastructure and the thinking that you have and let's apply it somewhere. And so what we realize is that East Palo Alto and communities like Oakland, Hunters Point, they're boiling over with potential. And for the most part, it's untapped. And so we are looking for ways. So Tundi and I are always in our team. There's a couple of them out there. Hi, guys. Um, um, <clears throat> we're always like, man, what's the next thing? Because like Sean said, college is a little obsolete. And I'm thinking, dang, I'm, getting, I'm so hyped that I got 44 kids in college. But really, it's paid for by debt like Sean said, um, you know, there's things happening. And so what, not that we're, we still want them in college. I'm not saying that. <laughs> Drop out, everybody. No, um, but what, it, what are we missing? And the thing that we started looking around, the other issue is that our kids were becoming uh, criminal justice majors. Everybody, <laughs> we're like, okay, that's not the industry currently. Um, so we looked around. We have Facebook. We're in between Google and Facebook. We're just smashed right in there. And so what we said is, we want to change, that innovators want to change the world. Innovators want to change the country. And we would bet that Facebook, Google, Yahoo, all y'all uh, innovators, you want to be actively involved in changing the world. And we're getting skipped right over that conversation because we don't know how to engage in the, in the community. So uh, we want to go beyond business as usual. We wanted to um, take our kids from consumers to producers. We are kids of color nationally are using this type of uh, stuff in ways that far more than other people are. But we're not producing. We're, there's a stat that's 1%, 3% of people in industry are people of color. But we can't get mad if we're not creating a pipeline. So we're saying, OK, we're going to create a pipeline. Uh, we wanted to do diversity. We know people that want to bring diversity to the workplace, and we know that 
it's not just people of color, it's people of different demographics, it's people of different communities. So that's what we wanted to do. And finally, we wanted to be able to join the industry that sound, surrounds our communities. How are we going to stop gentrification if we can't buy a house because we can't get a job? So that's really the thinking. And then we came up with Street Code Academy. Oh, quickly, what's that? Um, we may not have time to show this video, oh. but can you just give a summary on what Quickly, we were right, okay? <laughs> we're right on, and just stick with us because we're right. No, um, we, we kicked off a code camp. We had 24 young people. They came from, they did 110 hours of coding. They came from 10 to 5 every day, didn't miss a day, didn't miss a beat. Um, 41 mentors came through and were exposed to, so it was a duality a, a, um, of, of exchanging relationships. Uh, we had four tech companies that we visited, including Facebook, so thank you. And the best story of all is one of our students, she's a Pacific Islander woman, which is not even on the stat list. Um, she changed her major to CS, and so uh, she's 20, and she is so excited. Every day she comes in, she's like, ah, one more step closer to Facebook. So. <laughs> Yeah, well, uh, I mean, so I'll, I'll, the video is about, and it, I will share it with, with the link, maybe we can circulate it, but the video is a true testament from the actual participants about what it meant. My favorite story, and there's about 13 of them, because they all just had, they, they just rambled on how much, um, how much they enjoyed it, and I was completely shocked. Um, but one story was a story of an uh, 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 MMA fighter, in fact, and Coach Moody uh, knows him well. In fact, they're over in London right now on behalf of USA fighting for the world championship. He's a, he's a state champion fighter out of East Palo Alto. And he said, I'm a fighter. And the reason I like fighters, I'm talking about the cage and the stuff that's scary to me. He said, the reason I like it is because I get this adrenaline rush. And, boom, and then he said, I get the same adrenaline rush when I'm coding. I was like, wow. It was completely unbelievable, and it's, it's on there, but, you, but you'll, um, you'll see that. We have, um, it, it would actually take me too long to actually find it, because it, it's, it's a long thing. But anyways, the... What we, what we, want, what we um, have in the remaining 50 seconds is to try to tell you about what we actually do, right, the solution. And um, as Heather mentioned, neither her nor myself have experience in, um, like Dr. Rolando, or, um, in, in the kind of technology itself. What we do know is that folks are eager for this, and this could play a big role in transforming individuals, which is what we, we really get passionate about. We, we get excited about transforming individuals, and we see how this could play a role. So our number one thing is, hey, we want you to be transformed, and the programs that we have there do that, or aim to do that. Our outcome, as it says, talk, we want people who are culturally, community-minded, culturally savvy, and economically viable. We want them not just to create Facebooks, we want them to create their own institutions, their own um, Facebooks that are organically grown from them. And so we've developed uh, what we think is a really nice strategy to accomplish that. We've created a hub right there in their own community. Um, we're training them with the relevant technical skills. Um, we have pathways to, uh, for them to onboard or do jobs, and we have networking things. There are, there's a, a, a plethora of things that we want to transform individuals. We also, not just that, but we also want to have this be a, replica, a replicatable model um, for the country, right? We, we all aim to, as she mentioned, change the world. And so we need the help from other folks. We want this not only just to make some difference in the lives of the, of the, of the young folks and communities that, that we care about, but also about the industries that are serving us. We want Facebooks and Googles to be transformed when they get exposed to the brilliance um, and to the innovation uh, that we think could be game-changing coming out of these communities. Then we want to create this Motown effect, and we want to have, you know, just a, just a plethora of, of um, of, of new companies that are coming out in the culturally competent and responsible way that we think it can be. And then we think if we do that, we could do things like address gentrification in an appropriate way, and we can address um, equality in an appropriate way and level the playing field and all the things that we also care about in terms of equity for our young folks. So um, thank you for the time, and, and uh, hopefully you're able to, um, to join us. I'm sure you know more than we do about what the uh, intention around hackerspace it is, but we are building one um, right there in, in East Palo Alto, and we do aim to have that be a hub that folks can hang out and build and collaborate um, and have it be in our own um, home bring some, some authenticity to it. So thank you. Sorry. All right.
Heather and Tunde, Street Code Academy. Let's give them a round of applause. I want to put one plug in. Yes, um, they always do this. I want to put one plug in. If you like the videos that you saw, you should visit Mural Music and Arts Project, phenomenal arts-based uh, uh, nonprofit at East Palo Alto. And uh, then I give a big shout out to my main man, uh, Coach Moody over there, Mr. Moody. He's our councilman. Uh, he's a councilman. I knew him before a councilman, though. The question is, can can we get uh, can we get down the flush on iTunes? Is that is that that's what I want to know. Thank you guys very much. Our final presenter in Connect Talks is Andrew Turner. Andrew is a neo geographer. I want to know what that is uh, before the session's over here. And he's a purveyor of personal cartography, an aerospace engineer by background. Andrew became passionate about using technology as a way to have the world tell him about itself and to help people share and connect their stories about a place. He is the Chief Technology Officer of Environmental Systems Research Institute, or ESRI R&D for short, based in Washington, D.C. They develop open tools for everyone to build and share maps of our world. Their goal is to create collaboration between citizens, government, business, and researchers to solve meaningful problems. Andrew also develops open source tools and wrote Introduction to Neo Geography and Where 2.0, State of the Geospatial Web. Andrew, that's all yours. Hi, thank you. Is this on? Hey, thank you very much. I uh, really appreciate being here and uh, hopefully a good capstone for the great talks that we just saw um, about coders is uh, running a technology uh, company. It's actually incredibly difficult to find really good coders and developers. So please train them, teach them. Um, there's a lot of very valuable problems to work on and help solve. So I'm going to talk about something that uh, you kind of heard a little bit about. Um, my background, I used to build spacecraft and um, it got a little boring. I, I wanted to actually do things that actually put technology in the hands of people. Um, and so what got really interesting in, in this idea of neo-geography uh, when I wrote the book was applying all this amazing technology, this GIS that's been around for decades, and put in the hands of people. Because the technology is bringing people closer to their worlds and empowering them to define a future that reflects their values, hopes, and dreams. No one cares so much about the street and the buildings on that street as the people who live there. So how do government help enable them to help make those important decisions? When someone walks into a town council meeting, how do they come with an iPad with a map and a data-driven decision and complaint on it? and actually help engage with government with the same data that government's using to improve the city or town as well. So this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to make this easier to do. So we're all familiar with public infrastructure, where government invests in, in roads and buildings to make people be able to move around cities, build businesses, uh, connect communities together. It's this investment the government makes to help these communities grow. What does that look like now in an information economy, an information infrastructure? How do we enable people to utilize these tools and these data to build businesses and build better communities? You're seeing with social media, but also with the data that is actually being used around the city. Crime data, demographics data, road data, network data, uh, planning data. So this idea has, has become very popular called open data. Um, this is a, a McKinsey report published in October in which they uh, went and looked at the different six sectors of open data that were coming online. And these are kind of different major areas about natural resources, transportation, education. And key to that, and the lens that I tend to look through, is the fact that these all have a common location. It's how we can understand things like transportation affects access to education or affects health, how resources affect utilization of, of power, um, and being able to tie these together. Now, relevant to citizens and government is it's actually a $3 trillion market. And this is actually realized through more efficient government, better spending of budget, better consumer decisions, businesses being able to leverage and find new opportunities. And this is $3, thr $3 trillion per year. So it's a huge opportunity to make data from government and agencies available for people to make better decisions with it and make data-driven decisions. So the question is, is, how do we build this new public square? How do we enable the citizens to go and utilize something the government invests in terms of building a square in which people hang out so businesses come, and ha come, come there to serve those customers? So how do we do the same thing for information technology? So what we're doing is we've actually launched an open data application, which enables any government to go and easily within minutes launch an open data site. This is uh, Pasadena in which they just took all of the data that's currently in their GIS departments, already being managed, and they just clicked one button and it became available through a web application where anybody can go freely explore it, find the data, and download it in a lot of different formats. The idea here is for people to go and discover this information, um, look through it, find relevant information, whether it's personally about bike trails I might want to take, 
or it's about ones for my local community to go and build more bike trails or transportation, whatever that is. Enabling citizens to imagine their own world and look at it and provide their own perspective on it, use the data that the government's already gathering to improve those decisions. You can see here, this is just an example of that interface um, that's being used to go and find, for example, all of the proposed um, short bike trails that are going to be put in Pasadena, um, or go look at the existing ones and be able to visualize those and chart those out. So it's the beginning of some of these base tools to be able to enable people to go and put this on their iPad or print them out, and again, engage with government or the communities around this data rather than just purely what their emotion is or what they've known in the past. So what's really interesting then is, is where this is actually taking off and where it's being used. Um, if this keeps going, is uh, this might cycle. So we're actually, so we, we've seen this now being deployed across states, counties, governments, um, and, and able to be even fully customized. So there's now actually over, a, a, since it launched in July, it's um, and a thousand open data sites have been created. It's available in 24 languages automatically. So for the state of Maryland, it was actually their first multilingual website they had uh, for the government. So it's something, again, as, as any of you can go and, and share and turn this on with your GIS department and make the data available. I also do a lot of volunteer work in disaster response and, uh, and helping technologists go and uh, use technology and build interesting tools to help in their local communities as well. So this is an investment to make not just for times of you know, fun and, and building businesses, but so it's pre-positioned so when they need the data for their own response, they have access to that data. So something else relevant here uh, to this group is that um, uh, ESRI, we've actually donated our software to everything, every single K through 12 uh, school across the country. So every school can get free access to all the tools to utilize this data and actually do more than just even what I've shown you here on the map, is actually analyze and understand number of people by neighborhood or actually look at things like uh, availability of um, grocery stores compared to uh, areas or transit or bus routes. In terms of making these decisions, and they can now use and learn how to use these tools from kindergarten um, up through high school, and most universities also have it as well, to actually learn how to think geographically and take all this amazing open data. So it'd be interesting to start thinking about is how do schools themselves engage with the government? Um, as you saw earlier, the uh, Girl Scouts, we've actually seen a number of Girl Scouts and Boy Scout troops and local uh, civic organizations be able to use these tools to help understand and, and analyze their own problems. And so it's all freely available um, across the country. So I encourage you to reach out if you're interested in using this. So this is kind of just a, a pretty quick overview of, of what we're doing and what we're thinking and, and the potential here to utilize mapping and location and open data the government has to help solve and, and address a lot of the important needs. So whether that's risk assessment and disaster response, or just you know, where someone wants to go and open, open a local business. Um, the potential is huge for people to make these better decisions, as well as just increase overall community engagement um, and happiness in your city. So uh, it's pretty brief, and I'm definitely open for any questions, or feel free to reach out to me on, on Twitter or my email if you have anything you want to follow up with. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrew. Excellent. Any questions for Andrew? Scanning, scanning. Anybody for Andrew? Let's give Andrew a round of applause. Thank you very much. And uh, the staff has asked me to make a brief announcement, just a reminder that you can get the videos that were shown here and other materials, PowerPrints and, and PowerPrints, PowerPoints. Uh, and other materials that you witnessed today on the connectsmc.org website. So I know there was an appetite to watch uh, that second video. We, we couldn't get to it because of our timing, but lots of information at connectsmc.org. So with that, we are going to take a very brief break. Uh, just a little after 1.30, we'll start uh, our next panel. So just a brief break, 10-minute uh, hard break, and we'll be back. Thanks very much.